Um, we're going to talk about app dynamics in a DevOps context today. Uh, just to introduce myself, my name is Steve Sturdivant. Um, I am on the solutions engineering team based out of Austin, Texas. I know some of you in the room, but, um, but I haven't had a chance to work with the majority of you so far. Um, my role in the company is um, I work with uh, some of our strategic accounts on a pre-sales basis. Um, and the other half of my job is I run our DevOps champions group internally. And what we're focused on as, as an internal group is working with our customers who are thinking about or going through DevOps transformations to understand how app dynamics can help them, um, what are some of the industry best practices, what are other customers doing, and then also to understand what you guys are doing in the field. So um, quick show of hands, how many people are actually doing DevOps in some way, some capacity? Okay, so pretty good number. Um, and then how many people are not really, but are thinking about it or think that it's really important and are gonna be heading in that direction? Okay, so that was a fairly easy question. Um, so it's something that we're seeing extremely broad adoption of across the industry. And um, APM is, is a really important aspect of, of DevOps. And we'll talk about some, some of the reasons why. Um, to quickly introduce the, the other uh, folks from AppDynamics that are gonna be helping today. Um, so on your right, Scott, say hello. Um, Scott led our, our SVM lab uh, yesterday. Um, so if you guys took that, you've met Scott so far. Um, Hugh Bryan in the back. Um, Hugh Bryan has been at AppDynamics for 18 years now. He, was, he actually joined the company before it was even formed. Um, he knows everything about AppDynamics. So if you have any question at all about anything, Hugh is the guy. Um, Lim Park. Um, Lim is one of our Rockstar consultants. Um, he works with uh, some of our extremely large organizations. Um, uh, and he can, should be able to help, although I sprung it on him this morning. He hasn't seen any of the material. Um, he would be the next person to go and ask for uh, any questions. Um, Abi, Daria. Um, Abi is a uh, manager on the uh, professional services team, um, working with a lot of you guys as well. And then Brad Stoner in the back, um, works with our partner team as well. Um, really knowledgeable, has a really deep background in performance engineering. Brad, where did you run performance engineering before you joined AppDynamics? h and &R Block? Okay, kind of, they do a little, some stuff, right? A little bit. Um, so Brad helped put together a big chunk of this lab, so uh, thank you for all your help. And um, if you have any questions around like the load testing or we're gonna walk through Jenkins integration, um, Brad put a lot of that together, so he'd be a really good person to get involved. So what we're gonna do um, for this lab, has anybody not been able to get to that, that, that share yet? Okay, can one of you guys maybe try to help? And we're gonna move forward just, um, just to try to stay on time. Um, if you haven't been able to get to the, the share, just raise your hand and one of the, one of the lab attendees will, will help you get that uh, sorted out. Um, just to kind of introduce the session really quickly, the reason that, that we're having a, a, a focus track or, or um, a lab on DevOps is that it's, it's not only is it one of the, the most buzzword compliant terms that we hear today, but you know the, you saw the response from everybody raising their hand. Everyone is either doing or thinking about leveraging some aspect of what they call DevOps. Um, DevOps is, you know, one of the challenges is it's an incredibly overloaded term. I think if you ask 10 people what DevOps is, you might get 11 answers. And so what we did, what we did for the purpose of this lab is, is we picked some things that we thought were really useful and could be broadly applied in a DevOps context. Um, our customers are rapidly moving towards DevOps for a lot of the reasons that you see here. And, and you know, th there's, there's a lot of kind of theoretical discussion of what DevOps is, the three ways, and systematic thinking, and feedback loops, and product experimentation. Um, but one of the things that it seems to be pretty ubiquitous across our customer base is that people want to move to a DevOps model to increase the velocity or the rate at which they make changes to the system. And they want to have a very controlled um, and consistent way of doing that. And so they're leveraging things like automation um, and kind of next generation environments that have elastic scale. And they're looking at forming de better and tighter collaboration across their teams as things like the infrastructure become more important or a part of the overall application value proposition. 
So those are some of the things that we, we see in the industry, and, and those are some of the things that, that we're going to touch on today. So I, I found this um, as I was uh, preparing for AppSphere and with some of the work we do overall in the Champions Group. Um, I, I found this article written by IDC, who's an analyst firm. Some of you may have seen some of their work before. And I thought it was a really interesting quote. So this is not, this is not an app dynamics quote. This is um, one of the analysts in the industry. And they took a look at the top 1,000 enterprises that are starting to think about and adopt DevOps. And they talked about really what, you know, what makes those organizations successful versus, versus unsuccessful. Um, and one of the things that they came back and said is that you know, it, it's an interesting kind of paradox because um, you, know, you heard in the keynote yesterday, and, and this is something that originated from Gartner years ago, 80% of the time we have an issue or failure in production is because we change something. So, and that kind of makes sense, right? If, if you don't change things, things tend to kind of stay the same, status quo. So 80% of the time we, we change something or we have a failure, it's because we change something. But DevOps is really creating a movement where we want to change frequently. And so we have this balancing act of wanting to make a lot of changes, yet change being the thing that kind of drives and breaks our, our degradation in the system. And so tooling becomes a very important part of that. And if we don't have the right tools, if we're not le leveraging modern practices that really ally, align to these technologies and philosophies, that's where we start to get into trouble. Um, so I thought it was an interesting observation. So today, here's what we're going to focus on. Um, a couple of topics that seem to be top of mind for everybody. Um, one of the things that I'll, I'll, I'll let you know up front that we did have to cut out, um, so deployment automation. So um, AppDynamics has a lot of templates and content and best practices around deployment automation, whether it's using Chef or using Puppet or using PowerShell or other areas. The reason that we dropped that from the lab is because every, all of our customer environments tend to be just a little bit different. And we thought that if we ran a lab where we focused on a half an hour of Chef training, if you don't use Chef, that would be a half an hour lost to you. And so what we're going to do instead is focus on really applications of leveraging app dynamics in these types of environments. And if you do have questions around deployment automation or if you want to know about Chef cookbooks or puppet modules, we've got a bunch of people that can answer those questions. Um, stick around after the lab or come and find us. We'll be more than happy to talk to you about uh, those things and best practices. Um, so what we are going to focus on is um, integrating into continuous integration pipelines. Um, using compare releases to track performance drift across releases, um, how to deploy Docker in a containerized environment, so there's a, or how to deploy app dynamics in a containerized environment. There's a lot of interest and experimentation in, in, in moving to container-based deployments. Um, using the Docker monitoring extension, so pulling uh, performance KPIs from the Docker engine to the Docker host itself, um, and using service endpoints. Um, to get both the end-to-end -end picture that, we, that AppDynamics gives you out of the box, and then as well as to get a very service-focused lens into your environment. Um, so that's what we're going to cover today. Just to, to level set, the, the lab is, 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 I think we're finding that some of the labs are pretty ambitious in terms of trying to get 60 people through all of this content in two hours. So what we've done is um, we've spun up 60 VMs. Everybody should have an index card. Um, don't throw it away yet. Um, that's going to co correspond to a dedicated lab environment for you. Um, the lab environments will be available for the next roughly 36 hours. So if we don't make it through the lab or if you don't make it through the lab today, um, the environment, the materials will be available for the next day and a half. Um, you'll have access to it. You can continue to, 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 um, to walk through it. You can ask questions. I'll give you my contact information if you have any questions for follow-up. Um, the other side of this is that um, the way that we're going to try to do this particular lab, and I'm not sure what some of the other labs have done, but we're going to all walk through this together. Um, the lab does allow you to, if, if you don't fully finish a step or if you have problems with a specific thing, for the most part, we can go to the next um, part of the lab and it'll be okay. So if you get held up and then you find that we kind of jump ahead of you, it should be okay. We'll just keep going and then we'll let you guys catch up either or tomorrow or you can come ask us questions and we can get you caught up down the road. Any questions before we get kicked off? Okay. So here's the lab we're going to run today. Um, we've created a very simple environment, and I, I stress simple. You guys, your, our customer environments are massively more complex than what we're going to be dealing with today. But you know, hopefully this represents some of the concepts that you can leverage, and you can see how AppDynamics fits in these types of environments and take some of these things back 
um, into your best practices and how you're leveraging app dynamics. Um, so we're gonna have an application. Has anybody ever heard of Kona Cart before? Uh, Kona Cart is a, you know, basically it's an e-commerce platform. It's a, it's a reference um, Java enterprise application. It runs inside of Tomcat. Um, we did a little bit of, of, of hacking to it and we um, redeployed it inside of Docker. So we've got a tough couple of Docker containers. We've got our Tomcat instance. We've got our Kona Cart uh, backend, which is basically a MySQL database. Those are each running in Docker containers. Those containers are linked together through dot using Docker Compose. Um, and then we're gonna have, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a very, very, very simple Jenkins environment that's gonna be generating load. Um, we'll have our load tests. Our load tests are um, built on top of NeoLoad which has some integrations in AppDynamics. So we'll talk about how you can integrate your load testing into AppDynamics, do things like um, BT transaction and custom um, entry points to separate out load testing transactions. Um, we'll also talk about how you can push release information from Jenkins into AppDynamics. So you can have your release tags show up in your console and then use those to do things like compare release. Um, so to kind of automate some of the analysis that you guys are doing today. All right. so. To start off with, everybody should have, and this is really getting a little bit above our, um, in, fr in front of ourselves, everybody should have access to this, um, this store. Does anybody not at this point? Okay. So you should see a file there, and let me, I'll go ahead and bring it up on the, on the main screen so everybody can see. Okay, so there's a file called labenvironments.csv. So you guys wanna open that file. And everybody should have an index card as well. Does anybody not have an index card? Ben? Yes, the little scrap piece of paper that I know everyone was tempted to ball up and throw away. Okay, so you should have a unique number Go to this spreadsheet, the CSV file, find your number, and you should have a unique IP address. This is the only part of the entire morning that we have to coordinate. Um, everyone has a dedicated lab environment. Grab your IP, that's gonna be your lab address for the morning and for tomorrow. Is anybody not able to get to this or are we good to, to move on? Okay. So we wanna validate that that IP works. So um, the first thing that we wanna do um, is you wanna plug that IP. So in my case, I've got mine up here. And I've actually got a host name. Uh, that shouldn't be an issue if you have an IP versus a host name. But you wanna plug that IP address into your favorite browser. Uh, we recommend Chrome for the day. And then you wanna hit port, so it's gonna be your IP address colon 8080. and everybody should have a Jenkins instance running in their environment. And the username and password to your Jenkins instance is gonna be admin, and the password is gonna be AppDynamics. So for all of the logins today, well, for most of the logins today, um, for most of the logins today, the username and password is gonna be admin AppDynamics. Um, I'm gonna kinda keep going. If you have any problems as we go, as we're moving forward, just raise your hand and one of the guys will, will help you um, get situated. Okay, so you should be able to log into Jenkins and you should see a, there's a Jenkins job that's been preloaded for you, so you already have that set up. And that's gonna be the basis of how we run our load test and how we integrate and tag our releases from Jenkins into AppDynamics. One other thing to verify, and then we'll, we'll wait for uh, a minute or two and let everybody get caught up. Um, you should all be able to log into your own AppDynamics controller, and that's gonna be on the same IP address, colon 8090, as opposed to Jenkins is 8080, AppDynamics controller is 8090. And when you log into your AppDynamics controller, um, 
we are running on a, a shared multi-tenant Ravello instance. Um, so hopefully performance isn't too bad. It's been pretty good. It might take a second or two. Um, when you log into your App Dynamics controller, it should look something like this. You should see that you have two applications, Jenkins and Konacart. If you don't, that's okay. We're, they'll be created as we walk through the lab. Um, but it should kind of sort of look like this. Okay. If you have any problems, just raise your hand and somebody will come by and um, give you a hand. Um, otherwise, uh, we're gonna move forward. Okay, so next thing we wanna do is we wanna take that IP address um, and we're gonna log into our virtual machines. So if you have putty, we're gonna, we're gonna use two sh uh, shells for the day. So we're gonna have one shell that's gonna be actively running our application environment in the foreground and then you wanna have another shell that you can kind of do some work in in the background. So if you use Putty, um, open up two Putty sessions. If, you're, if you have an SSH client, and Mac, or if you have Linux OS, um, however you wanna do it. But you wanna log into your environment and the password, so take your IP, SSH in, so the command is, if you're using, um, uh, an SSH client, it would be SSH space IP address, I'm sorry, space Ubuntu at your IP address. So the username for the virtual machine is uh, Ubuntu, so it's gonna be SSH Ubuntu at your IP address. Password is app dynamics. And once you're in your lab environment, if you just wanna run, um, you can do an LS, or if you wanna run Docker PS, or Docker images, you should see a bunch of stuff there. And, and we'll talk about what's there, so um, we won't go through each of the uh, images right now, but you should see some stuff there. Does anybody need help getting into their lab environment? Is, is everybody good? All right, we'll give everybody a minute just to catch up and then we'll, we'll start moving. Um, if you are in your VM, um, so when you log in originally, you're gonna be in the home directory of your Ubuntu user, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna work out of the, there's a subfolder called App Dynamics AppSphere DevOps Lab, you're gonna wanna be in that. Uh, and then within that, there's a subfolder called Docker. So this is gonna be your primary directory for the day. So you wanna be in, log in, you're in your Ubuntu home, home directory, then you're gonna go into App Dynamics DevOps Lab slash Docker. And that's, that's where you're gonna wanna be for the day. And you should see um, some Docker image, uh, some Docker files, some shell scripts, start lab, stop lab, restart, things like that. I'm sorry? Yeah. Anybody need help or everybody good so far? I'm sorry? Um, Todd Rader just joined us. Todd, 
Are you, thank you. Um, so Todd is uh, on the solutions engineering team as well at AppDynamics. Um, he has also never seen this lab before, but I roped him into helping. So um, if anybody else needs help, Todd is available, Lynn's in the back, um, Brad, Hugh, and Scott are floating around as well. Please just raise your hand and, and we'll get you guys logged in. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna keep going. If you're, if you're finding yourself falling behind a little bit, um, we'll try to get you, you caught up. Otherwise, um, you can kind of go through the lab with us as we do it interactively. Okay, so the first thing that we're gonna do is we've got our environment deployed in our Docker containers and we get a lot of questions about, um, and this might be basic for some and it might be new for others, but we get a lot of questions of, does AppDynamics work in a containerized environment? So we're starting to explore moving to Docker uh, or we run, wanna run in wherever it might be. How does AppDynamics work in a containerized environment? Um, so the answer is, is that it works the same um, as it does in a non-containerized environment. It's very easy to add an AppDynamics agent or to run something like an AppDynamics database agent inside of a Docker container. Um, we're gonna build that straight into our Docker image, rebuild our lab environment, and then we'll start our lab with AppDynamics now enabled. Um, so what we're gonna do, and we can, we can do this together, is um, bring up your favorite editor. We're gonna edit the Konakart app server Docker file. So, I'm partial to Vim. Um, so Vim docker file dash Konakart dash app server. So that's our Docker file for the application. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna scroll down and you should see the comment that says the following sections enable the AppDynamics agent on Konakart. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna uncomment out. There's an add line. So what we're doing is we're adding our AppDynamics agent into our Docker image. Um, we've also parameterized the agent version. So in your environment, essentially you would have an artifact repository or you could be pulling this from our download site if you wanted to. But we're gonna parameterize the agent version that we're adding in, into our image. In this particular case, we're leveraging AppDynamics 4261, that's the default. Uh, and then we're gonna add that into our Docker container under slash opt AppDynamics. So that's all we have to do to add the agent into a Docker image and run that as part of a container. Then we're gonna run a command to unzip our agent. So you wanna uncom or comment out, uncomment the run. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna parameterize our agent by adding a uh, controller info file. So if everyone's probably worked with the controller info file or um, you could also set similar options through the command line um, so we're gonna add the controller info file into our Docker image that tells the agent how to send data back up to the controller. The other thing that we're gonna do in this particular case is um, you're gonna wanna uncomment out the, um, the add command. So what this particular uh, file does is it updates the Tomcat startup so that it adds the AppDynamics Java agent directive. So when Tomcat starts, AppDynamics is bootstrapped into Tomcat and then it shamads it, it gives it execute permission so we can run it. So th that's, that's really all we need to do. Um, we're gonna add the agent, we're gonna unzip it, we're gonna add our configuration file, and then we're going to give our um, set ENV script execute permissions. And once we've done that, you can either exit out or go to your other shell you wanna run the command build lab containers.sh. And this is gonna rebuild our Docker images now with AppDynamics added. So at this point in time, what we've done, we've added the agent, we've parameterized um, which version of the agent that we're pulling in from our ar artifact repository. It goes into our Docker image. We're rebuilding our image now with the agent added and we've updated our application script to bootstrap the agent into our Tomcat process. Any questions conceptually on how, how that works or what we've done so far? I'm sorry? Yeah. So 
So last command, build-labcontainers.sh. I'm sorry? Uh, Docker file dash app server dash Kona cart. Sorry, Docker, Docker file dash um, Kona cart dash app server. Is it hard to read? I tried with, it's, it's up to 24 now. I tried going above that and it didn't really fit on the screen. Um, Okay. Okay, how many people have been able to rebuild their images with the, uh, with the agent added? Okay, right around, right around 50, 60%. Okay, anybody, if you need help, raise your hand. We've got people floating around that can um, come give you a hand. Okay. Um, Next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna drop the machine agent extension, so the Docker monitoring extension into our machine agent. Um, how many people have deployed a machine agent, uh, an extension before? So some, maybe, maybe about half. Um, so there's, there's a couple of types of extensions with, within Ad Dynamics. There's extensions that enable the controller to integrate with other systems, so things like a ServiceNow extension, a Splunk extension. Um, there's alerting extensions, um, and there's also data collection extensions. So for things where it doesn't really make sense to deploy something like an application monitoring extension, but we still wanna be able to monitor a subsystem, maybe we wanna monitor our F5, or maybe we wanna monitor our Docker engine, we have data collector or data collection extensions that can be easily dropped in. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to our AppDynamics machine agent. That's under opt app dynamics machine dash agent. So opt app dynamics machine agent monitor, monitors, and to deploy an extension is, is really very straightforward. So we're gonna take the extension, um, it gets downloaded typically as a gzip tar file. We drop that into our monitor subfolder, and then all we have to do is Untar it. Oops. And I've already done it, so I'm getting some conflicts. But in your environment, it, 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 should, uh, it should be available. And basically, it just deploys and unpacks directly into the machine agent um, uh, subfolder. So it's app dynamics machine agent monitors. And then the command you want to run is tar xvf. and then the Docker monitor, and that's 1.0.26 is the version .tar, and then that drops right in. Has it already been added? Okay, all right, cool. So, um, if it's already been added, then, you sh then we're good to go. Anybody still having problems getting the APM, APM agent added to your Docker image? Okay. So now that we've, um, we've added the APM agent, we've added the Docker monitoring extension to our mach machine agent, um, let's go back to our AppDynamics Labs subfolder. So you're going back to at Dynamics at AppSphere DevOps Lab slash Docker. 
And then what we're going to want to do is run the command start lab.sh. Um, probably not. If it's already deployed. If it if it wasn't deployed, then yeah, then yes. Was it? Uh, oh really? That's okay. The command to start the lab. Um, so the command that you want to run is start dash lab dot sh. Hey guys, in your in your um, in your Docker file, if it's already uncommented to add the agent, then you don't have to do anything. So you want your Docker file should look like this. It should say add artifacts, unzip the agent, add in the controller info. People were able to get their app server started. Okay, so when you start your app server, when you start the environment, so we're using Docker Compose under the covers to link our app server with our backend database. You should see all of the log information start to scroll through. Our APM agents now deployed into our doc running Docker container. And as we generate load through, we should be able to start to discover the transactions as they come in. The question was, should the lab start pretty fast? It should start pretty fast. Oh, okay, yeah. So the app server itself takes um, roughly a minute and a half to two minutes to come up. So when you start the lab, you should see log files immediately, but then it'll take a little bit of time for everything to fully bootstrap. And, um, and you'll, you will see some, some errors. Um, the app server comes up sometimes before the database. We haven't worried about orchestration between the containers. So don't worry, if you see exceptions, like I can't talk to MySQL, that should resolve itself. Don't worry about that. Anybody else need help getting the lab, getting the lab environment started?
All right, we've got a couple people um, catching up. So when you get your lab environment started, go back to your controller. We haven't started generating any load yet, so we don't see anything on the flow map. That makes sense. But you should be able to go to tiers and nodes, and you should see a tier called Kona server, and it should have a node called docker container dash dash and then an index. You, should, you will probably only see one. That's okay. Um, and we'll talk about why that is. Okay. So just a couple of things to think about when you're deploying into a potentially dynamic environment, and that could be um, an Amazon in a platform as a service environment or a containerized environment. So although not directly derivative of DevOps, what we're seeing is that one of the fundamental things that a lot of our customers want to get from kind of adopting some of these practices is more on-demand elasticity of the environment. They want to be able to grow their environment based upon the workloads that they um, that they're experiencing at a single point in time, or they want to be able to grow their environment uh, as they do staged deployments. Um, maybe they're bringing on customer bases across different regions. They want to be able to grow their environment over time. And so one of the questions we get a lot is, okay, from AppDynamics perspective, how do you deal with dynamic application or elastic environments where you have to set node names and tier names and application names, those things are static, so how do you deal with those? Um, so there are some configuration options w in AppDynamics. Some of you may have used them um, already. Maybe this is new to others. But you can say things like, I want to use a dynamic node, node name prefix. So in this particular case, we've set an option that says, I want my node name prefix to be Docker container. And then I want to, over time, reuse node names. And so what will happen is, as our node is scaled up or down, our node will always be docker container dash, and then it'll be the index, which is indicating the number of containers that are running at that point. So the reason that I have four nodes is because I ran my lab several times this morning, and every time I started my lab, I got a new docker node. So we set a static prefix, and then AppDynamics dynamically assigns a node index based upon how many nodes you have running at that point in time. Um, the other question that comes up is, well, how do I avoid node explosion? So what happens when I fire up 50 nodes and then they go away over time? I don't want AppDynamics to maintain that record of all of those nodes over time. I don't want to continue to dynamically grow that node name. Um, and so there's another property in the controller side as well that allows you to purge that data. And you can um, completely delete it so it's wiped out of the underlying controller database, or you can just tell the UI to, to make it go away. Um, so there's two properties. By default, we keep node names in our, um, in our backend data repository for five hours. You can change that down to an hour. So you can say if a node name has, go if a node has gone away and hasn't reported data for the last hour, make it go away. Delete it permanently or remove it from the API. And that's how you avoid node explosion in an elastic environment. Yeah, so those are, and those are the two options. Option one, nuke it all together from the, from the backend database. Option two, make it go away from the UI because it's not there anymore. Um, if you make it go away from the UI, it's not available in the metric browser. Um, next time, so let's say, that you, let's say that you start up a node, you get a bunch of workload, and you're using something like Docker Swarm or Kubernetes to dynamically scale your environment. All of a sudden, a bunch of people rush to your application, and we decide to scale up three additional nodes. You start with node, docker container node dash one. You scale up to two, three, four, and let's say that workload goes away. So at that point in time, you have a couple of options. Do you want, that, do you want those nodes to be kept in the historical data? Do you want those nodes to be available in the UI for further analysis? Or do you want the nodes to be removed from the UI because those nodes are now gone from your environment? So those are the three options you have. Um, and you can kind of decide what works best in your environment.
Okay. So hopefully everyone or most everyone is at the point now where um, we've got our nodes and you can see my Docker container dash six over the last 15 minutes is 100% available so it's fully up and running but I haven't pushed any load yet. Um, so another thing that, that we want to encourage from a kind of a DevOps philosophy is, is better collaboration really thinking about moving practices from a development environment through test, functional tests as well as performance tests and then in production. And so one of the questions that we get sometimes is where do we leverage app dynamics? Um, and, and really the best answer is, is everywhere. This is, you know, APM is a practice that, you know, we're seeing more, more and more people want to shift that left. So as we're writing the code, we want to be leveraging APM to validate performance in the unit inter integration model. We want our performance engineering teams to be leveraging APM to uh, non-functionally validate and help troubleshoot the releases. And then we want to have all of that knowledge and, and practice then shifted into our production environment. So we're leveraging APM there as well. Um, one of the things that we often want to do when we're running load tests is we want to have our BTs directly correlated with the transactions we're driving from our load test platform, whether that's something like Load Runner or you know, JMeter, or in this case, we're using NeoLoad. But we want to know when the transactions originate from our load test versus originate from natural user traffic. Um, and a really good way to do that is through custom match rules. Um, so if everybody could jump over to their AppDynamics controller, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna put in place a configuration to say when I see a transaction, if it comes from my load test script, I wanna name it so that I know all of my Neo load tests and they're separated out from my user uh, transactions. So we're gonna go to configuration, instrumentation, we're gonna customize our Kona server. And we're gonna create a new custom match rule. How many people have, have done custom match rules before? Okay, so maybe 30, 30 40%. Um, so custom match rules can be used in a lot of scenarios and context. Um, the concept of a business transaction, the, the idea behind it is the business transaction maps to the unit of work or function that the user is doing. So if they're logging in or hitting the home page or looking at marketing content, that unit of work really maps to something that our user is doing with our application. So from a load test perspective, we want our BTs to align and map to the load test transactions that we're driving through. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a new custom match rule. It's gonna be a servlet custom match rule. And you can name it whatever you want. You can call it load test or you can call it neo load. Um, or you can call it anything. And we'll just set a priority of 10. Um, we're gonna walk through it right now. Okay. Um, so if we have multiple rules that could match, let's say that we create a rule that says I want to match on foo, and then I create another rule that says I want to match on foo slash bar. If I have a request that comes in and it's foo slash bar, either rule could match, right? Because they both say, the first one says foo, the second one is foo. So, exactly, yep. So it, it's setting the priority of the rule that we're creating. So when we create a rule, we want to do a couple things. Number one, we want to say what transactions does this, does this match? In this particular case, um, we're gonna say match all of our transactions where the URI is not empty. So you wanna check URI and then the last box, URI is not empty. So basically we're gonna, we're gonna apply this match to all, all transactions. Um, the second thing we're gonna do is we're gonna look for a specific parameter, HTTP parameter, and we're gonna check that that parameter exists. Um, in the Dropbox share, there is a doc, there is a user guide that, that walks you through that if you want to open this up and jump to the section, you can copy and paste the parameter name. But the parameter name that we're looking for is neoload-transaction name. Capital N, capital L, so neoload-transaction name.
So we're going to say, when we see this request comes in, we're going to match on the URL, and we're going to look for a specific parameter in the request. And if we see that parameter, that's going to match our custom, um, custom match rule. So now we've decided what transactions, what incoming requests match this rule. The other thing that we want to do is we want to decide, OK, now that we've created a match, do we want to split the transactions? And so basically what split means is, is right now with just the match, every request that comes in that matches my, my rule is going to be named low test. Because we've just said match everything that comes in. We don't want all of our BTs to be named no test. We want our BTs to map to the transactions that we're generating from our low test. So we're going to apply the split rule to then split them out. So the split rule is going to use the same um, uh, it's going to use the same directive. So we're going to create a split rule on an HTTP header parameter. And it's going to be the same split rule. Split rule. Yes. So Neo uppercase N, neo load dash transaction name. And then we'll go ahead and create a custom match rule. Okay, now when we create custom match rules, depending on the language runtime, um, some of the runtimes support you know, basically dynamic instrumentation. So depending on what type of rule we have to create, sometimes it requires us to dynamically re-instrument the application. Other times it's really just configuration that we apply that can be dynamically set. Um, in this case, what I'm gonna do is just for the purposes of time, I'm gonna go to my lab environment and I'm gonna stop my app. And I'm gonna restart it. And basically what that does is by restarting the agent, when the agent initializes again, it's going to go out to the controller and say, hey, do you have any configuration for me? So it's going to just force and flush this configuration to happen a little bit uh, uh, more quickly. So we'll stop it, and then we'll restart the lab. Anybody need help? Uh, we picked up a couple of lab attendees, so there should, there's, there's a lot of hands available. What's that? No, they don't normally. So now I know that if you, if, now I know that you, when you read them and you're just ignoring me down the road. Okay, so we're gonna restart our lab. It takes about a, a minute, minute and a half, up to two minutes for Konakart to boot, and you'll know that it's ready because you'll be able to go to your IP address and then on port 8780, you should be able to hit your Kona card app. And it should look something like this. In fact, it should look like this. Exactly like this. If it doesn't look exactly like this, it's Scott's fault. Um, port, and again, this is all in the user guide, so you guys have access to that. If you want to take this away and really walk through each one of these step by step, there's a lot of contextual information for why we're doing these things and how it works. Um, you guys have access to the lab environment um, through tomorrow evening, so you can certainly uh, take that away and do that. Um, I know we're moving a little bit fast for some folks. Okay, so I can see my log files. You start to see things like deployment of web application directory. Um, now it's scanning for, for uh, so it's, it's close, it's coming.
Anybody else need help? Okay. So mine should be up. Um, you should see, if you're looking at the log files, you should see server start up something like 127,000 milliseconds. And then at this point in time, you should be able to go, again, it's your IP address colon 8780. And you should be able to hit the app. Ben, did it, have you gotten your, yours up? Nice. Anybody else got their app up? Okay. How many people have their how many people have Kona Cart back up and running? Okay, good. Does anybody else need help? Um, talk, okay, thank you. Okay. For those that have, we've got about 60% of the room with their apps up and running. So for those with, with your app up and running, go to Jenkins and let's kick off our load test. So typically we would have a much more realistic CI pipeline where we'd build our app, test our app, maybe do some security or code coverage, some functional analysis. We would deploy our app into an integration environment we would have the full CI pipeline. And one of the things that we may want to do as part of that, um, one of the things that, that we used to do um, uh, when I was running performance tests as part of um, Agile releases is we'd have a performance validation step that worked as part of our pipeline. Um, and so when we, when we do want to look at non-functional code quality as part of our CI pipeline, it's very easy to have AppDynamics integrated into that process. Um, in this particular case, we've only got a single Jenkins build job so not really reflective of your environments, but it, it, it gets the point across. Um, what you're gonna wanna do is you're gonna wanna, you see this little arrow here, for those of you that haven't worked with Jenkins before, go ahead and click that drop down. Oops, I got lo logged out. If you get logged out of Jenkins, again, the uh, username and password is admin and app dynamics. So you wanna click that drop down and then you just wanna run the Jenkins build job. So click build now. Okay, so what's happening under the covers, once we run our build job, you should see we have our Kona Cart load test, web UI front end. So this is now running our performance test using NeoLoad. So NeoLoad has, um, not only is it a great performance testing platform, but it's got built-in integrations into Jenkins, very useful and valuable if you guys don't have um, a load test platform already. So we've kicked off our load test, that's running now, and that's gonna start generating transactions against our application, and hopefully we created our custom match rule correctly, so our transactions are, are now aligned with the load test that we're running. And so if we wanted to go at, into AppDynamics, maybe if we have a mixed environment where we have some people doing functional testing, or maybe we're testing in production because we don't have a dedicated perf, uh, perf test box, if anybody ever asks us the question, can we focus APM on our performance test, because we've created this custom match rule, now we can very s easily segment out our load test transactions from all of our other test transactions. Um, and that's really useful for release comparison, building custom dashboards, looking at transactions over time. If we don't do this step, the problem is, is that if we have lots of um, people kind of interacting with the environment, then we've, we've grouped their request into our transactions, and now our transactions aren't consistent from run to run. So this gives us a really good way to have our APM data be directly aligned and segmented to our load test. Does that make sense? All right, so now that we've run our load test, now we go back to AppDynamics and we see our incredibly complicated Kona Cart application that we've dynamically discovered. Hopefully yours looks like this too. Um, I, you know, for, for those of you that might be a little bit newer to AppDynamics, I'm not sure what everyone's experience level is. I know we have some people that pretty much do this as their full-time job, um, and that maybe you know, others are seeing it for the first time. 
but we still get questions a lot of the time, how does AppDynamics work in, in Amazon? How does it work in a containerized environment? What do I have to do to discover my application? Um, the answer is pretty much nothing. So fundamentally, what AppDynamics is doing, this screen was blank five minutes ago. We ran our load test, we started to drive transactions through, and what AppDynamics has done is dynamically discovered our application server. So we see our Kona server, this is our tier. We see all of our Docker container nodes that we've dynamically named because we used the configuration property that said dynamically name our nodes. And now we know that we have a dependency from our Kona card application to our backend MySQL instance. So we've discovered this automatically. Also, if we go to our dashboards, because we've installed the Docker extension, what the Docker extension actually does is not only does it start to monitor your Docker host and your Docker engine environment, but it automatically dynamically deploys a dashboard into your AppDynamics controller. Um, not all of the extensions do this. This is a pretty cool feature of this particular extension. So you drop the extension into place, you point it at the Docker stats API, so it starts to harvest those KPIs from Docker Engine. And not only does it collect the data, but it automatically uploads a dashboard into your controller environment. So you should be able to see that we've got a bunch of containers that are running. No, some people are shaking their head. Okay. Um, if you don't, what you can do is go to dashboards, delete your dashboard, and it'll automatically repopulate it for you. So delete it, give it about 60 seconds, it'll recreate it for you, um, it should work. If not, um, we'll figure it out. People really like the answer when I say, well, it works for me. So in a, in a, in a Dockerized environment, and this would be the same if we were running in Amazon or leveraging something like Pivotal Cloud Foundry or Azure, there's two things that we care about. How's our app doing and how's our infrastructure doing? So we can leverage the APM agent to monitor and manage our application and then we can leverage the right extensions to monitor and harvest KPIs from our infrastructure. And we wanna bring both of the, those data sets into the same place because our app is now very much impacted by the infrastructure that it's hosted on. And we wanna be able to know how many containers do we have running and what's the CPU utilization per container? If we look at this particular chart, um, what it says is that our Kona cart app server, so we've got a couple of containers that are running. Well, which container is using resources on our host? In this particular case, it shows me that my, my Kona cart app server is the container that's running in Docker that's using the most resources of my host. So I can start to understand not only how my app is performing, but how my Docker environment is performing as well. Same thing for memory usage, my images, network utilization, all of those KPIs. Also, if I, yes. Yeah, so there's, there's two ways. So Docker, Docker provides performance KPIs natively. Um, it has a stats API. There's two ways to connect to that API. You can either connect locally, so you can install the machine agent on the same host as your Docker engine, um, or you can connect remotely as well. Um, if you, if you want to run the machine agent uh, remotely from your Docker engine, then you just have to make sure that the stats API is available to be connected to from a remote agent. Um, it, it kind of depends. Some people get a little funny about running things on their Docker host itself. Um, and, and then other people would say, well, I, I get a little funny about opening up remote connections to my stats API. So I, I'm not sure I know the answer to that question. I think it just kind of, your mileage may vary. Okay, so we've deployed our app agent. We see the flow map dynamically um, update. We validated that our Docker extension is pulling performance KPIs from our Docker host. We've added the custom match rule, so now our BTs are aligned to our load tr test transactions. And sure enough, if we go into our BT list, you should see a list of load tr test transactions that are neo load dot, 
and then whatever transaction was generated by our load test. How many people have gotten this successfully? Couple? Anything that we can help with? Correct, the Kona card application. You have transactions that just don't. Oh, well, you should. Yeah. Don't align. Yeah. Like they, they all these should have no alignment. Yeah, yeah. Um, we can check the match roll, so it's probably just maybe it's a, a copy and paste thing or. But I, I, I typed this up. I, I know. I think it was yeah. Yours. Um, it, if the match rule isn't working, uh, so what I'd suggest is just so we can kind of go through the rest of the concepts of the lab, um, the exact directions are in the user guide, and that's an easy way to copy and paste and just make sure that we have the right syntax and we're not missing anything. But um, I, d I cheated, I copied and pasted, and that might be what's, what's um, getting a couple of people. Um, but, but when we have the right match rule in place, so we do see our neo, neo load transactions so our custom match rule, we name NeoLoad, and then we split based upon that parameter value. So we see all of our BTs that are now split depending on what transaction was generated by our load test. A um, couple other things, so if you don't have the, the match rule um, set just right, don't worry about it. It's not going to impact getting through the rest of the lab. It's just a good example of how we can kind of align our monitoring to our, our pre-production practices. Um, did you get it? Yes. Yes, I'm sorry. HTTP header parameter. It's not a query parameter, it's a header parameter. Yep. Yep. A um, couple other things I wanted to point out. One of the things that we did as well is we're leveraging the REST API to publish our build and deployment events into AppDynamics. So if you go to your events list, what you can see was, you can see where we've done an application deployment, and the summary corresponds to our load test, which maps directly to our Jenkins build job. So now from Jenkins, as we run different phases of our pipeline, whether it's deploying the app, starting a test, whatever it is, we can align our, what we're doing in Jenkins and our deployment CI pipeline we can publish events into App Dynamics. And we can use those events if you wanted to do things like look at the transaction score. So if you look at the transaction score, you should see at 10 o'clock in the morning, I know it's a little hard to see, here's our Jenkins event that we pushed from our job. That's where we started our load test. All of a sudden, our response time goes up, our transaction workload, our throughput goes up, and then at 10.17, we've got a second uh, event that says this was our load test stop. So now we can very clearly align 
our APM monitoring, as well as our BTs to the performance tests that we're running. So what I'm going to do is actually, I'm going to zoom in, and I'm going to say set this as a global time range. And then I'm going to go ahead and save that time range. So you can go ahead and give it a name, Jenkins load test one, description load test one. So now we've got a custom time range that's saved that maps directly to our load test. Um, this could also be a deployment that we push into production. It could be any other meaningful time period that we want to save. Right, but the important, I think the, the takeaway is we've, we've leveraged the REST API. So as we do, as we have different events that happen in our Jenkins pipelines, we're creating notification of those events in AppDynamics. The other thing that we've leveraged, if you want to go back to your Jenkins environment, and if you click on the build job, one of the things that you'll see on the right is you'll see performance charts, average response time, error rate, average response time overall. The way that we're getting these is we've installed the AppDynamics Jenkins plugin. So that's another of the extensions that's offered by AppDynamics. Um, that's free to use uh, and install in your environment. Um, it drops in as a Jenkins plugin. You can very easily configure it to point to and collect performance KPIs from AppDynamics. And it also gives you some options for um, build control. So if you want to fail your builds or control your builds based upon performance characteristics, you can say, if my build, if my performance test degrades by a certain percentage, then I actually want to fail my build. And so then you can, you can do things like control your pipelines and maybe you, wanna actually, maybe you don't want to deploy something into an integration or a production environment because it's failed a non-functional performance test. And so you can do that with the AppDynamics Jenkins plugin. Um, we're not going to go through it in detail, but it's pretty straightforward to set up. You basically point it to your controller, give it a username and password, and then set the KPIs that you want it to, to pull. And then it's responsible for getting those and pulling that information across all of your build jobs. So you can see here, it shows you things like average response time across each build, what was your error rate across each build, um, different KPIs that are visualized and that can be used to control your builds. This is an extension, yep. So it's on the, so if you just type in AppDynamics Exchange, you'll see the list of extensions that are available. Um, the two extensions that we're using today, we're using the Jenkins integration plugin, and we're using the Docker monitoring extension. Both of those are free for you guys to leverage and install. Yeah, yeah, the only thing you have to do to configure the Jenkins extension is just point it to the controller. So give it the controller URL, username and password so it can authenticate, and then it'll pull the metrics back for you. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You can Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the question was, um, what happens if I'm running performance tests or running tests but I'm not doing it from Jenkins? Can I still get this level of integration? Um, so the answer is definitely yes. Um, so what we have customers that leverage Load Runner, um, and whether or not you're using NeoLoad, um, standalone, you basically, you'd still use the same approach. You'd, you'd essentially have your startup script or your test publish an event through the REST API that says, I'm starting my test, and then you'd have it published to the same, it's just a, it's just a REST API call that we're making. In this particular case, we've used a Jenkins post-build step 
a pre-build step and a post-build step to make that call. But you could make that call from your script. You could, you could make it from anywhere. Um, as far as actually passing in, doing the integration of your load transactions, it, that really has nothing to do with Jenkins. That's just passing in a header value, or it could be passing in, there's different ways that we can create those custom match rules. Um, whether it's a parameter, or a cookie, a header, uh, we look for a certain thing and we say, okay, pull that out, and that's how we're gonna name our transactions. Yes. Yeah, the REST API is pretty rich. It does most anything that, that you would want to do. Okay. Um, so for the purposes of time, we've got about a half an hour left, and um, we're, I, I guess the good bad news is that we're backing into lunch. Um, so if people um, want to stick around and go into the lunch hour, we can, we can continue to um, kind of run through the steps, but we're actually doing pretty good on time so far. Um, okay, so next step. So now we've got a set of transactions. If we look at our transaction score, I use this view all the time. I'm not sure if you guys use it or not. Um, I think it's really useful to be able to see kind of how workload impacts response time and how the ratio of slow to very slow transactions correlates with the number of transactions that are flowing through the system. And so you know, basically what you can see is right in the middle, right here at 1013, when we hit the peak of our load test, that we were generating roughly 180 transactions per minute, um, our response time spiked way up. So now we know we, we have resource contention in the system. There's some type of bottleneck that's happening that when I generate more load, I get higher response time. And I can see, because the orange and the yellow went up as well, that the, that the percentage of slow and very slow transactions has, has also increased. So not only is my overall response time going up, but the numbers of very slow or slow transactions are, are also increasing. So if you see a pattern like this, this is a really in clear indication that you've got some sort of bottleneck or contention in your system, and now you can trace it back to know that that, that maps to the number of transactions you're driving through. So you've got a capacity or a contention problem. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna use AppDynamics to figure out which one of those transactions are degraded. So there should be a couple of things that, that float to the top. Um, the transaction that, for this partic uh, particular lab, the transaction that we actually really care about, and um, I'm gonna cheat, I'm cheating. Um, Actions.homepage, this is the transaction we care about for this particular lab. Um, what we can see here is that, so here's our throughput chart. Here's where we started our load test. And interesting, what, what we can see is that when we started the load test, our response time was actually the highest. So there was, some, there was something about when we started to run these transactions initially that, that, that caused some issues, some response time degradation. And when we go and look at the transaction, now we're looking at the transaction level flow map. So this is our homepage transaction we can see that the majority of our time is spent in a backend database call. Okay, this tells me that on average, when I called to my backend database, the calls took 13.1 seconds, which is 1,434% of my overall transaction time. Does anybody know how my backend call could be 1,000, 1,300, 1,434% of my overall response time? What? That's, that's potential, potentially one, one way. Not, a, not in this case, but that's a good answer. Anybody else? How can, how can the aggregate response time of a backend call be greater than the average response time for a transaction? So one answer is if you're, uh, if you are leveraging asynchronous backend calls or asynchronous activity, and you haven't set up your asynchronous markers to kind of really handle that. Um, the other way is if you only make calls to backend systems um, a, a partial uh, uh, part of the time. So in this particular case, this transaction ran 15 times
and our backend database call actually ran 240, 204 times. So we have a mismatch of the number of times that the backend um, database call ran and the number of times that the front end transaction call ran. And some of those calls were extremely slow, which is why the backend time in aggregate is greater than the overall transaction time. Um, if we looked at this call under the covers, so when we find issues that are driven by backend systems or when we have common bottlenecks at application layers, what we can do is we can say, well, let's go and focus on all of the database calls to my backend MySQL instance. And we can see where the response time was degraded. And then we can bring up our slow database calls and we can see which of those slow database calls automatically rise to the top. And if you look at this, hopefully what you see is that you see Konecart calling your backend MySQL instance. If you go look at the slowest database calls, you should see that our slowest call that occurred in my environment 88 times, an average response time of 3.8 seconds, is a delete call, delete from customer basket, where customer basket customer ID equals and then my SQL bind parameter. Is anybody else able to get to this point? Couple, okay. So we ran our load test, our BT is aligned to our load test. We're able to see that we had degradations related to the amount of load that we're driving through the system. We go in, we can understand that it's a problem with our backend database, not our application. So we've isolated where the problem is in the environment. And then we've looked at the slowest database calls and AppDynamics says, you know what, all of these other calls run in milliseconds. Here's the call, it ran 88 times, and on average it runs at almost four seconds. So that's the thing that we need to go and focus on fixing. Um, if you would like to, what you can do, we have a tool in here called AD Miner. Um, it's not an AppDynamics tool, but it's a basic, um, front-end shell to uh, a back-end MySQL instance. Um, through AD Miner, we can connect to our back-end MySQL instance. The server name is konacart-mysql. The username is konacart, and the password is in your user guide. It's it was set by Konecart, it's, it's long and, and complex. Um, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna log in here. We're gonna pull up our Konecart database. So AppDynamics told us that the issue that we had was with our delete from customer basket. So that's the table that we care about. which is this table right here, customers underscore basket. Um, and if you go and look at, so here's all the fields in our table. And if we go and look at the indexes that are created, we have um, an in index on customer basket ID, but the where predicate is, pulling, is deleting data matching on uh, customer ID, which is, is not an index field. So in this particular case, what we wanna do is just alter the indexes we can add a new primary index on customer ID. Oops. It's gonna be index. So we've used AppDynamics to diagnose the problem. We're missing an index from a, a table that we're deleting data from. And now we can come back in and we can rerun our load test to validate the performance fix that we've just pushed through. So as this runs, this takes about five minutes to run. And then what we're gonna wanna do is we're gonna wanna go back. So we've run a performance test, we found a problem, we've, we've related that to a missing index in our backend database, we've talked to our DBAs, they've added the new index, now they say, okay, can you go and rerun the test? So now we're gonna rerun the test, 
and we're going to want to know how, what, what impact did that, did that fix have on our system. And this could be production. This doesn't have to be a performance test environment, but um, we were able to catch this because we've got integration into our CI pipeline. We've been able to correlate the performance impact of the changes that we've made in the system. We've been able to use App Dynamics to diagnose the root cause failure of the problem. Now we're going to go back in and we're going to validate the fix that we've just dropped. And there's a couple of ways to do that, but the way that I like is there's a feature called compare releases. How many, does anybody use compare releases in their environment? I've tried. Tried? Unsuccessfully? Not as, <laughs> a little successful, okay. Yeah, I, so I agree. Um, so you do have the Jenkins integration plugin. So if you, if you make a fix and rerun your CI pipeline, that should reflect, um, from a KPI perspective, the change across test. Um, but the, the, you're right, the compare releases functionality, right now there's not programmatic or API access to it, so it, it is a manual function to go in um, and do that release comparison through the UI. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty um, requested feature, especially you know, in a highly agile or, or a CI CD environment. Um, our, our PM team would be the, the best team to talk to about that. Um, uh, they're in the, the vendor hall, they have um, lab booths, and I, would go, I wouldn't leave until you get an answer from them as to when they're gonna provide that feature. Absolutely, yes. So you're, you're absolutely right. So you can create a custom dashboard. Custom dashboards can all be executed as periodic reports. So you can have a report that um, runs every day. Um, or you can have a report that is tied to the frequency at which you run your CI pipelines. Yes. Yeah. So by segmenting off our load test transactions, that has a lot of downstream impact including we can have health rule and policies that are specifically targeted to our performance test transactions. And so maybe I don't, maybe I never go in and look at compare releases unless I get a health rule violation, unless AppDynamics says, hey, I ran this performance test and response time of my key transactions or overall um, degraded. And now that, dry, that, that makes me go into the UI and do that next level of, of diagnostics. Any other questions so far? Okay, so we've got a couple minutes left um, of our load test. I'm gonna, I'm gonna cheat a little bit. So here's where our load test kicked off. It's been running for about four minutes so far. The load test lasts about five minutes overall. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and save that global time range. Okay, so here's my first load test. Here's my second load test, which is still running. Um, I can get good summary KPI statistics, so this load test has only been running for about half of the amount of time as the first one, so I can see the number of transactions that were executed, roughly double in my first load test to my second, so that makes sense because it's only been running for three minutes now. I can see that the response time has dropped from 1.6 seconds to 240 milliseconds. So now when somebody comes back and says, hey, we just dropped this code into production or we just dropped this new release into my integration environment, 
what was the impact of this? Well, this is a really easy way to come in and say, well, you had this many initial, uh, this, the, the transaction workload difference was this. Um, you had 40% more transactions. You had 20% less transactions. Overall, your response time has changed by this. It's gone down, after we made that fix to add a new index to our backend database table, our response time has dropped from 1.6 seconds to 240 milliseconds. Our number of slow transactions or errors have dropped from this to this. So I can use AppDynamics to help me really quantify the impact of the changes that I'm making to the system. And so, you know, we, we kicked off the session by saying we kind of have this paradox where 80% of the time that something breaks, it's because I changed something, but I'm creating this whole, this organizational philosophy where I want to change things all the time. And, and, and how do I manage that? How do I, how do I ensure non-functional quality with, you know, high velocity changes? And, and APM is really a critical part of that, or, or at least we think so. And we think that as you're changing things, you should be coming in and looking at the performance indicators, or as you heard um, in the keynote session, the business in indicators as well. I just changed this thing, what was the impact of the thing that I just did, and what do I wanna go and do next? Leveraging these metrics to start to drive priorities from a development um, or a release perspective. Uh, you can also, not, uh, in addition to looking at the release in aggregate, uh, we can focus on specific transactions. So if we, want, if we know we had a problem with a specific BT, here's our homepage transaction. Our homepage transaction on, a, on average dropped from 640 milliseconds down to 277 milliseconds. So we can look at the, the, the application in aggregate or we can go and compare specific BTs. Um, if we're changing architectures, which we're not doing in this particular case, oh interesting. I just put in the 429 release last night, so I guess we've introduced a new feature. Um, but you can use the flow map to look at architectural differences in the environments. Um, you can look at load and response time, so you can see, does my transaction mix? Does my response time profile change over time? Um, really useful features, or as was suggested, you can leverage custom dashboards to do the same. So we're gonna cover one more section. We've got about 15 minutes left. Does anybody have any questions about what we've done so far? Leveraging AppDynamics in a containerized environment, using the node properties to handle dynamic naming and reusing node names across elastic environments, tying into our CI pipelines, compare releases, using the REST API to push performance markers, the Docker extension. We've covered a bunch of stuff so far, and I know we've gone a little fast. Um, yes? I'm sorry? How do we, yeah, so, okay, license usage, because we're integrated into our load test, really no different, right? Because we're monitoring the backend application, so the license consumption, depending on what type of application we're monitoring, could be OS-based, could be JVM-based, but it doesn't really matter that we're using AppDynamics to measure performance of our load test. Um, we've just aligned our monitoring to the load testing that we're doing. Yeah, it's just the same. Yep. So we haven't installed the database agent. Everything that we've done from database analysis is monitoring the database calls within the application layer. Um, it, it, you know, we could have gone into the database agent and we just really just didn't have the time to get into that side of it. Um, so the only, the two things that we're using in this case that are licensed is the, is the APM, the Java APM agent. Um, so the APM agent is deployed into our Docker container. And we have uh, our server visibility monitoring agent as well. So if you go into servers, you can see all of the infrastructure metrics that are being collected. So you can see, here's my AppSphere lab. Um, it's running in my AppSphere hierarchy. Here's my dashboard, my disk volumes, my network information, all of the processes. So those are the two things from AppDynamics that we have uh, running. This, this is the full machine agent that we're leveraging for this lab, um, but the Docker extension runs either in the full machine agent or in the standalone machine agent that you may have been using or still using at this point. Did, 
Q. Yeah, so the, so the question was, what happens if I spin up an environment that has, let's keep it simple, 10 servers, and I do some stuff with that environment, then I tear it down. And then I want to go and spin up another environment that maybe has 20 servers, and I want to do some stuff over there. Do I need 30 licenses, or do I need 20? Right? Is that? Well, actually, let's say 10 and 10. Okay, 10 and 10. Spin up 10 new ones. Yeah. So, um, so the answer is yes. Um, AppDynamics will reclaim licenses that are not being used. So licenses are not tied to a particular application or MAC address. So if you spin up an environment that has 10 servers, and let's say you're consuming 10 licenses, then you tear that down. Those licenses will free up. Then you can go and use them on another environment. How long does that take? Um, roughly five minutes. Lim says five. So. If, if it's not five, Lim said five. <laughs> it should be five. Yeah, so the licenses are available in a pool to be used. So if you want to apply them to different environments or different use cases, um, they are available. And then as you saw in the keynote, there's new license management capabilities. So you can start to allocate licenses between different application teams, between different profiles. Um, a lot more fine-grained control with where those licenses are allocated. Yes. I'm sorry. Okay. So the license management is applied on the controller side. So the controller has a pool of licenses depending on how many licenses you bought. And as you spin up new agents, Basically, an agent comes up, it consumes a license. So, um, license the new license management features will help you with that. I'll, I'll be I'll be honest. Um, the license management capability is 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 not re fully designed to make that a really easy thing to do. Yeah, you basically have to stop the agent today. Yeah, so that you can administer the agents, you can disable, you can go in and you can, through the controller, you can uh, dynamically disable the agents. There is control over that. Um, but, you know, if you have an environment and you've licensed agents for part of that environment, there is some effort to be able to, to manage which, you know, which things you're actively monitoring at a point in time. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left. The last thing I wanted to highlight, there's a feature in AppDynamics, um, and uh, is anyone aware of or using service endpoints today? A couple. So we get a lot of questions, especially in, in these types of um, customer environments where we have very service-focused development teams. And you know, we hear at, at times, hey, I know AppDynamics does a great job with the end-to-end -end monitoring, but we what we really want, what we, you know, if I'm a developer and I own a service, what I really care about is a service-focused view. And so service endpoints um, have the ability or really are designed to give you that service-focused view. Um, so the way that service endpoints work are very similar to BTs, um, but they also can work on downstream tiers. So where a business transaction is applied to the first time we see a transaction, 
If that transaction crosses multiple downstream services, the service endpoints give you that service-focused view and KPIs into your downstream services. Um, in this case, you can see that um, our service endpoints have discovered essentially all of the BTs that we've also, um, all of our, our front-end uh, web tier uh, endpoints as well. So uh, within Konecart, we see a lot of struts actions. Um, and if we want to, you know, one thing I would recommend doing, both from a BT and a service endpoint perspective, is to kind of audit your BTs, audit your service endpoints. We really want service endpoints to, to map to the services that you guys care about monitoring. Within our application, we've discovered these struts endpoints, but in our world, they really aren't, they're not services. And so even though AppDynamics has discovered these, what we want to do is really disable these and then focus on the true web service endpoints. So um, service endpoint configuration, very similar to uh, BT configuration. In this case, it's really easy. What we uh, want to do is we want to disable our struts action. And then Konecart has a set of web service endpoints um, that are offered as well. The reason that we discovered the struts action is because it sits at a higher point in the call stack and the call chain than our web service endpoint. So when the call comes in, the instrumentation for the struts endpoint discovers it first and then names it based upon that struts endpoint. And really from a service perspective, we don't want to see the struts actions, we just want to see the web service API calls that our e-commerce platform is offering. So we can disable the struts endpoints, make sure um, our SOAP web services are enabled, and then when we restart our app and start generating load um, through, then we're gonna have a service endpoint focused view on just our web service APIs. Um, and it gives us, um, Google says there's four golden tasks for, um, or golden signals for monitoring a service. Um, consumption, uh, latency, number of requests, and error rate. We get three of those right out of the box with service endpoints. Um, and then it's pretty easy to, to, to pull up, a, bring up a dashboard to look at saturation or consumption as well. Yes? Is there, the question is, is there a limit to how many service endpoints? Yes, there is, there is a limit. Lim or Todd, do you guys know what the, the service endpoint limit is? Hundreds. 500, okay. Yeah. Um, those limits are configurable though, right? Yeah, there, there's there's two impacts. So there, there's really two impacts with not going through and refining our configuration. You know, number one, if we have someone that comes in and wants to look at all of our service APIs that our application is exposing, and they see all of these struts things, from a user experience perspective, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. And so if I have operators that I'm enabling to use AppDynamics and I want them to be monitoring the services that I'm offering, I don't want them to have to hunt and peck around for the things that they care about. So we should, you know, we should go in and refine our BTs, refine our service endpoints, so they map to the things that we care about and that we monitor. AppDynamics does a great job with discovering a lot of things out of the box, um, but there are going to be things that we discover that you say, you know what, for my environment, I really don't want, I don't really don't care about that. So let's make sure we go back in and update the configuration to not put those things front and center. Let's make it easy for our operators to have a good user experience of using APM. Um, the other thing to consider is that when you have all of these service endpoints, what we're doing is we're generating metrics for each one of these service endpoints. Um, and so you think about from a capacity perspective, this impacts the amount of data that we're storing, this impacts the infrastructure. Obviously the more data that you ask AppDynamics to collect, that we have to have infrastructure to be able to process that data, store that data on disk. And so if we're collecting a bunch of things that you really don't care about, that impacts your cost of ownership on the back-end infrastructure side as well. So there's a lot of advantages to going in there and really making sure your BTs are refined and tuned for the things that matter, your service endpoints, we're, we're collecting the right metrics that matter. Yes?
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. It's basically just a big bucket categorization. And, and there's kind of, I think, two general approaches. And I'm not sure if, which one you recommend, Lynn. Um, Lynn works with a lot of our customers to do this. Number one, we start off with an application and we enable BT lockdown from the beginning. And so everything goes into catch all. And then we kind of use that to prioritize which of the BTs we want to pro you know, promote into being full fledged BTs. Um, and then the other is that you know, we start out with full discovery and then we use that to kind of pare it down. that help? Yeah. Okay. I think that's, that's a really important step to go through. Um, you know, we, we have heuristics that we apply and, and they may or may not be the right hu uh, heuristics for you guys. So going through and refining BT is really important. Guys, I, as you're uh, taking off, I just wanted to thank everybody for coming out. Um, we're gonna stick around for a couple minutes. So if there are any questions relating to the lab or things that we didn't cover that are top of mind from a DevOps perspective, you know, as we said when we kind of kicked it off, it's a pretty broad space, so um, we tried to pick things that we thought that would be useful for you guys, hopefully they were. But if you have questions about other topics, please let us know, we'd be happy to cover those as well.
Thank you very much. Yeah. 